Welcome. I'm um, inviting Colin to join me. Uh, he might be at the other session still. So yeah, I expect Colin to show up any minute. Uh, we have 30 minutes until the open space computing platform panel where where some of the key people involved in the open spatial computing platform uh, on different levels will uh, will present their uh, work um, but now we have an opportunity to um, to talk a little bit informally and have some questions uh, maybe on how to get involved uh, and some of um, some of the more the specific things around the test beds themselves. Uh, how, what, what do we uh, think is required to set up a test bed at your location, if that is of interest? So, feel free to uh, to ask questions, and if somebody would like to to um, take part in this conversation, we can add you to the. Uh, to the presenters. So I see we got Marco here. So are you, you want to go, uh, go on with us, Marco? Uh, I can make you presenter. So I'm, try I'm making Marco presenter. And if he wants, he can turn on his, uh, on the camera and the microphone. So one thing we can say, we, we have this list of maybe more than 20 cities around the world that could be good candidates for, for test beds. But it doesn't really make sense right now to, to fire up those test beds until we have and gain some experience with the first two test beds. Uh, and one of the reasons is that there are resources involved. You have to sort of make an investment in, in mapping an area for a test bed to make sense. And you have to put up servers. And currently, the reality is that our partners, uh, Augmented City and Immersal, they are both the coordinators and the sponsors of those test beds. And further, doing further, uh, further test beds isn't really uh, something we can ask our partners to just sponsor. We we might need uh, other uh, other stakeholders to show an interest and to to provide the funding for further test beds. So, do you want to? Are are you uh, on audio, Colin? I can see your video uh, and just froze a little bit. Oh, you don't have audio? Are you locked with the audio in the other? Okay, I think Colin is reconnecting to see if he can uh, figure out how to get this audio back. So, interestingly enough, you know, we, when we have made some estimates um, for what it would take to to run a test, but in a really large city, uh, a city with millions of people. So we have a pretty clear picture uh, what it might take uh, to do that. And then we also have uh, estimates of what it would take to do smaller sized cities. So by reaching out to us, we can figure out what sort of test bed might uh, make sense. So we're starting up with two different sized test beds. The, uh, the one that Immersal is starting up in, in uh, Helsinki is uh, a number of city blocks in the city center. And the one in Bari is covering basically the whole city with, with 100 square kilometers. So we, we already have a little diversity for for how test beds can be set up. 
uh, and we will learn learn both uh, both types of test beds. Uh, obviously, uh, there are some use cases that requires a very large area to to really test, and there are a lot of other use cases that uh, do not require such a large area. Yeah. Um, so we got a question from from Ali. Um, he asked, "Can you expl please explain what do you expect from a test bed partner? Can you explain in detail how much of an investment is needed?" Um, so um, I think we we should uh, work a little bit on the details on the on the actual amounts for different size test beds. We we have some preliminary. Uh, uh, we think sound estimates for for those um, prices, and I think that will be come up on our website eventually. But on the more um, on the level of what the partner should do, uh, except from providing some funding, um, what is really key is to to get involvement with local stakeholders because the the platform is. Uh, ideally suited for local uh, use cases, local businesses to take part. Uh, that is some that is part of what we want to to uh, to check with the test beds. If we if that is that's sort of an assumption that this would work well uh, very well for for local partners and uh, local businesses, uh, but we. Uh, we don't know that yet. So, so the, uh, those who organize a local test bed, they one of the key responsibilities is to reach out to to the city level, to local businesses, and also invite external parties from outside of uh, of the local area to to see see the different aspects. So let me see. Uh, academia, obviously, that is a great thing to to bring into the test bed. Uh, this is a great research opportunity. So, uh, if if there's um, R and D going on in a local university, that is definitely something that would be great to include in a test bed. On the technical side, um, we are seeking collaboration. Colin is trying to get in. <laughs> uh, are you hearing me now? Yeah, I finally can hear you. So I was um, about to start talking about technical aspect. What what sort of technology things uh, would we like to do in test beds? So uh, we have seen some presentations from both Nokia and Ericsson. They are doing 5G technology. We can do the test beds without 5G in in the early phase, um, and that could make sense. But for many of the really advanced things we would like to see in there, like in like everyone in this industry realizes that high bandwidth, low latency is required for a lot of those really cool things we and useful things that we would like to see. So you have the 5G technology providers, then you have the telcos who can uh, support the, um, the actual 5G um, subscriptions uh, in the local area. So, so they are um, uh, a key potential technology partner. Then you have the OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, who are making AR devices um, and self-driving cars and robots. Uh, all, all of which are <clears throat> uh, potential things that could connect to the open spatial computing platform. And we have some discussions with, with um, a couple of hardware manufacturers, and we're hoping eventually during this first year of testbed phase to, to connect with uh, and include them in the testbeds. You want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, I want to say that this first round of testbeds, it's based on an incremental approach. And so while Jan is describing uh, some of our longer term goals that we're trying to achieve, um, 
Our initial test beds are going to do just a few things and we hope to layer onto that a little by a little. And so fundamentally, the test beds that we're doing this year are going to do a few things. Uh, first, they, they uh, support queries based on your geo posts. And so what that means is you can take not only your location in space, but the way that your camera is facing. And with that position, we can ask the system, hey, what spatial mapping data is available for this location? And then what content is appended to this location? And the variety of content is going to evolve over time. But initially, we are, we are looking for, for artists, for cities with municipal information, that could support stuff like uh, the GLTF format. Uh, we're a big fan of OpenXR, and uh, these these early systems, as you heard Jan mention, um, it's really people participating in the testbed who are hosting the infrastructure, and that's by design. Uh, OpenAR Cloud's goal is not to run infrastructure; it is to create open, interoperable infrastructure, which which really means that our our goal is really just to facilitate that interoperability, and with that in mind, it makes absolute sense just now you host your own website on your own server. You're going to want to host your own spatial content in order to retain that control. But you need for everybody to be able to discover it. Otherwise, you have a publishing problem, right? You don't want to have to be beholden to a walled garden that has 100% of the market share of people's attention, nor, nor do you want your content to be hosted in a way where it's too hard to discover which is why it is so important that we have this sort of reciprocity model where anyone who's wanting to participate in a testbed needs to agree to index some of this information and host it so that when someone comes to a location, if you want a testbed in your city, you, you would need to help host this, this index of what spatial map of this location is available and then what content is appended to the real world facilitated by that map. Yeah, we could say that testbed uh, coordinators that you should make sure that they sort of bring their own data. Um, testbed is almost like a dead place if uh, if the spatial discovery service is not populated with uh, spatial content records and spatial service records. So it definitely makes sense for a coordinator of a testbed to to either if they sell them 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 they self uh, have those kinds of data that they can put into the spatial records they can do so or or they find some they bring in some partners to the test beds that can put that kind of content and i mentioned now there there's two like main categories of content uh, uh, the, the the direct content that could be like a gltf file it could be a uh, Actually, audio that is, has a location, uh, but it, audio also can have an orientation. Like like a real speaker will have a directed audio, so you have more audio in one direction than in, in another direction. So even audio can have use make use of a geopose. Uh, but then there's this other, and I think that is really exciting. Uh, you could have a spatial service record, and the service record doesn't have to be something that open air cloud uh, is defining. It could be uh, a service that complies with some known API uh, or some known protocol uh, that we have had nothing to do with, but it's registered on, on the spatial uh, discovery service. And when you're there, you will find that this type of service is available. So one example of that is uh, if NVIDIA uh, uh, enables their um, their cloud or edge compute rendering for XR to be uh, available at a speci special location with low latency, they could register that on the service and they can say, we're using this API. And here's how you send assets to our server. Here's how you send a post to trigger a rendering frame. Um, so, so third parties with other types of services that we haven't developed can register the, this stuff on onto the spatial discovery service and make it available in a very flexible way. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. Uh, so, for anyone interested in, we we are focused on Europe this year, but we uh, we 
we have already begun talks with several uh, locations in the United States that are also interested in hosting test beds. And oftentimes people interested in test beds come to us and say, what is the minimum cost? And it's, it's kind of a variable because it depends on how large of a space do you want to make publicly accessible and augmentable. And it also depends on which spatial mapping technology uh, company you use. Uh, and, and it's not a set number, but realistically it can be achieved for around the $10,000 mark for, for this one year test bed period. But again, those variables depend on how big is the area? What are the privacy yeah. concerns with this area? What kind of content do you wish to host? Uh, what, what local compliance issues need to be addressed. And so OpenAR Cloud has a team of people who for each test bed we are going through and we are identifying uh, what, what are the specifics of your use case that we need to fulfill? How can we make this work? And you know, the goal is that eventually we will paint the world with data in a way that the same applications and use cases will be the world over. But since we are in such an early research phase, we are really uh, taking smaller parts of a bigger problem and we're solving little chunks one at a time. And I'm very excited personally for the test beds because of all the privacy and security concerns. Anyone who caught Kavya's talk earlier, uh, that rubric is so important. We are going to be observing that rubric as, as we uh, go into our own test beds uh, so that we can ensure that we are respecting the privacy, the dignity yeah. of individuals, yeah. their behavior, and and their property, because uh, you know it's XR is such a powerful technology. We just can't afford to get it wrong, and so these test Actually, beds really is... provide us that opportunity to uh, to make mistakes on a very small scale in a space that we know we have permission to augment, that we have permission to have a spatial map of it. And then by the time that this is mature enough where it can extend safely into private spaces if somebody wants to augment their Yeah, so what, home, what Colin touched on there is actually uh, should I, We will have an exportable model. Yeah. We should have I should have mentioned that when I talked about the requirements for the, for those who are running a test bed. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely vital that uh, when starting up a test bed, uh, there's um, and dialogue with the authorities of that city, uh, especially like in Europe, when you're doing, uh, you have to comply with the GDPR re regulation and other types of regulations. Uh, so we we not only want them to be in like basic compliance, but we we want to have this front and center. So uh, we will work with. Uh, organization like like XRSI, and we would ask our, the participants in the test beds to be open for uh, third party audits uh, when when we have um, done enough research to to figure out how to perform proper audits on on the participants, um, and and that we will sort of uh, push the the limit uh, further on on, uh, on on having a high bar on on different kinds of ethical dimensions and security dimensions uh, to to build this fundamental trust for this type of platform that we're not just a bunch of techies that are putting together really cool technologies and not really thinking about these really important issues sometimes we and we have to put work into uh, into figuring out some really hard problems before we just go out there in, in, and scale, try to scale this across the planet. We need to do that only after we have a solid foundation. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. The long-term implications of, um, of what we do today will make the complications of two-dimensional social media seem quaint and simple by comparison. The amount of emotional influence you can have over someone through XR, the amount of private data, the amount of biometric data that someone can expose by using an XR device uh, is, is really quite valuable information and, and not something that should be given away lightly. And we understand that. And so from the ground up, we are designing 
our our spatial computing platform in such a way that any any vendor who wants to hook in and use these protocols and these standards uh, will, by design, be required to reciprocate with this model, where the the user is put before business. And there's still lots of room for business use cases, but uh, we we feel that the future is um, is human centric, and uh, we this value needs to be front and center in order for uh, for people to trust trust the system enough to entrust it with this very intimate, sensitive data about themselves and their environment. Uh, and, I think and the, so, the trust the trust itself is probably going to be vital for for business at least if you want to like reach the potential of what you could do uh in economic terms because when there's little trust um uh, either people are s sort of suppressed into accepting that that's sort of a dystopian kind of thing but if if people still have some freedom and they see that this if they feel that there's no trust there they will be reluctant to to engage and be reluctant to adopt the technology. And that doesn't only apply to individuals, but that also applies to, uh, for instance, a business that has a facility and they're doing operations within that facility that isn't meant for, for the public. So the security aspects of it uh, is uh, vital to make, make them trust uh, their business with this technology. You don't want your um, your business secrets to leak out to your competitors by accident or uh, poor design. Mm. And th this is one thing that really distinguishes the OpenAR cloud model from some of the walled gardens that are out there that do make it a lot easier, but it's just a non-starter. If you are a private corporate campus and you want to augment your campus, that data is too valuable for it not to live on your own servers. And so if, if anyone who's attending and watching this today, uh, if someone were to ask you what's OpenAR Cloud about tomorrow, I would, I would hope that the takeaway that you get is uh, OpenAR Cloud is a group of people who are working to make sure that uh, as we start to paint the world with data, we do so in a way that is decentralized, interoperable, and privacy respecting. And we believe that if these three values are prioritized, in a way that all sorts of businesses and authors can publish and participate and, and build their own technology stacks uh, with this common standard in mind, uh, the future could be very bright. Yeah, I'm noticing that we don't have many minutes left before, before the next session where we actually have uh, some of the key people uh, working on the open spatial computing platform and also the GeoPost standard. Um, I can see we got on our list, we got James Jackson is actually on here. Uh, can I make you presenter? And would you like to say a few words before, before your panel? Are you able to turn on your microphone, James? I also have Miko here. I'm making Miko presenter. <laughs> the UX it's only is a, a few minutes slow. left. Yeah, it's uh, only you know, but we're just left, so. we're just kind of having a freewheeling discussion. But in the in the panel coming up, uh, some of the specific details and some of the partners who are really getting into the implementation side of this, because I I realize Jan, you and I have kind of been speaking uh, philosophically about what our goals are, but uh, the upcoming panel is very important because it talks about implementation. And to, to hear from some of our partner companies that are actually taking this concept and running with it and proving, like Miko here, uh, that is so important to, to okay. demonstrate that it's real, not just a big idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, Miko, you, you were the first one who actually said uh, your company would like to support GeoPost from your visual positioning service. Yes, we were kind of accidentally working on it at the same time this thing came up, so we had no reason to say no. <laughs> so basically, we implemented our first GeoPose um, like 
well implementation in February, I think. So now it's just a matter of adopting it into the open AR cloud well, uh, open space or computer platform standard. Yes. Well, Do we have any questions? Uh, Alina is, and Orca is uh, talking about the small uh, small size, starting small, um, that is, uh, what you have a f actually you have a few uh, city blocks uh, and you can do a bunch of use cases you have indoor location maps uh, and outdoor location maps so yes. one of the things one of the things we could actually test even though it's only a few city blocks is the use case of going from outside to the inside and and still have your geopose yes that's hard that, to do uh, yeah. with the satellites that works. We we have like mapped indoor spaces and outdoor and combined them. And so you when you walk from outside to inside, uh, it uh, keeps tracking and giving you a geo post. So for for those who don't know in our audience, um, a lot of current mapping technology depends on line of sight with a satellite dish. And so as soon as you walk inside a building you lose that notion of position or you lose quite a bit of accuracy, accuracy even if your phone yes. still knows a little bit about position. And so a partner like Immersal, what their technology enables is when the GPS signal starts to fail, visual positioning cues uh, take the job over and continue the work that uh, GPS is able to, to do outside. And so to build that smooth transition, is actually very impressive and difficult to to maintain, I imagine. <laughs> yes, difficult and difficult. Um, anyways, we, we're at the three minute mark. So I think uh, yeah. perhaps yeah. Uh, we should all move over now to the, the next big marker room where the panel will be meeting. And uh, I just want to thank everyone who's attended today. Uh, it's It's not, quite as good as being there with you all in person, but I'm very glad that I still get to see some of these faces and and feel the enthusiasm for this uh, shared spatial future. Great. Yes. Good to so see I'll you. I'll stop Colin. the recording here now and get ready to jump into the, I see Steve Smith is there already. So see you over there. All right, thanks everyone. Okay.